Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Rich had him, uh, had brought up um, in, in similar ways how essentially, you know, the, the Coal Shack show wasn't ready for what the Coal Shack audience was able to handle. And, you know, that, you know, of course, being this idea of, you know, a, a continuous narrative that, that plays throughout that. And certainly, you know, the, I don't think he needed a sidekick per se. But yeah, one of those people on the street, if he had maybe just three of them, you know, who he'd go to back and forth. Um, I just think that would have been fantastic. But he always needed, you know, someone to help him give this uh, story to an eyewitness or the expert that he would find. And um, I loved it. But I think it's also just, that, you know, it's that, that sort of studio system pretty much where you had all these actors on contract. And you had to use them in things and they were all, you know, people who could do character uh, parts and just you just pop all those people in there and, you know, be done with it. But just it it is interesting to know that um, McGavin was frustrated with it. He wanted something more out of it. He knew that it really needed to go more from that. And uh, it's it's funny that one or two interviews that you can see of him talking about the show. Sorry, I left my mic up way too high there. Yeah. Um, those one or two interviews where you can see he corrects the pronunciation of coal shack to his way of saying it, as opposed to Jeff Rice and other people on the show who wanted to call it coal shack. Yeah. And he, you know, the, he had that, that report is like, no, it's coal shack. Yeah. And, uh, he's like, man, that's so McGavin. <laughs> no, yeah. I mean, there's no doubt that McGavin was a major. So in, in the early chapter, I write about kind of the creation. I, I talk about Jeff Rice a little bit, really sp- spend time sort of thinking about Matheson and Dan Curtis and their kind of backgrounds. And then Darren McGavin, because I think you're absolutely yeah. right. He, but it's interesting when you look at the television series, it's very clear that ABC didn't quite know what to do because partly they kept moving it around the schedule. And originally they put it later because they wanted to keep it away from kids because they thought it was too violent. And there was a little bit of an FCC getting anxious about violence and those kind of pressure to reduce the violence and crime shows. And so ABC kind of puts it later. And then they realize that that's not getting the audience and they don't quite, they're not quite making an adult show. So they move it up close to the $6 million man, which was kind of their, their flagship of that night. And so it's, it's funny. It's very clear that ABC didn't quite have a clear sense of where this should fit. Um, but I do think, you know, there, Dan Curtis had a precedent for serial horror. It was just during daytime. It's like, you know, Dark Shadows was a potential land uh, a map of the landscape of how could you do extended monstrous Gothic stories. But of course, Curtis is kind of out of it after the first two movies. It would have been interesting to see what would have happened if the series had been given to him to develop. And what would Dan Curtis have done in terms of making the series? But again, this is the kind of speculation we have over a couple of beers where we can argue about what could have had, what could have, what have, should have. It's just not what happened. And, and you know, I think Kolshak also suffers a little bit from something that I think nowadays would be corrected is that uh, it suffers from that. You know, nowadays you have a writing room of people. You have people curating stories. And especially with a show like Kolshak, you still want a through line or you'd want a through line with a character. But, in, but there's not really as much of a through line as there is a formula. It feels more formulaic than it does, hey, we, we feel like we know Carl, which, we, I mean, we feel like we do, but it's more like, oh, we know how, the, we feel like we know how the show is going to go is more how it plays out. And you get these new riders, you know, like uh, I think Zemeckis did the uh, Headless Motorcycle, uh, the Chopper episode, you know, and, and that gets a lot of flack nowadays or, or whatever. Uh, we're going to cover that with our friend Buddy Candela one day. But, but you know i mean even even those you have these different this rotating door of riders whereas even nowadays i think with the twilight zone reboot reboot you still had people curating and sort of like hey let's bring up these stories and let's cherry pick who we bring in whereas at that time it's just like hey anybody can write for Colchak, just give us something and we'll give anybody a try well and the the series also kind of went through producers and part of that was probably darren mcgavin who historically did not like anybody who was the executive producer of the show so if there was a showrunner uh, they were constantly under pressure, budget pressure. McGavin wasn't happy. Ratings for the series, the ratings were never what they wanted. Like they were just, it wasn't like it started super hot and dropped. It started ish and dropped very, very quickly to 
No. I mean, I think it tied in the ratings at the end of that season with the Sonny Bono Hour. This was Sonny and Cher's Solo Sonny's yeah. uh, review show. So this was not a pop. I mean, influential, yes. Beloved, yes. Popular, no. Right. And I think you're right. Part of the problem was they couldn't translate the vision of the first two movies into a series they and they they fell into the easy trap of hey if as long as we can come up with a new monster each week we can play this over and over and over again but adult audiences aren't going to watch scooby-doo like that i mean they're not going to they're not going to be willing to watch mr jenkins the pharmacist in a mask get unmasked every week like at some point you got to build something more and that was part of how the series died and probably that's also part of why it had such a legacy i think it was probably the the fact that the series was short-lived had so much promise and failed is part of what made it so influential. Yeah. And, and certainly they didn't have the showrunner aspect that we have now, but you did have one of the most consistent writers within it being the guy who's written, you know, possibly the greatest uh, gam uh, gangster series ever, David Chase. Oh yeah. And, you know, and Chase talked about how really he loved the aspect of humor being within uh, the storylines and it took him a while i think he said to be able to write for mcgavin uh in doing that they didn't necessarily see eye to eye but eventually they're able to and and uh that's i mean that's just something amazing to me and i you know it took me such a long time after watching the zombie episode to cue in on who was one of the writers of this and you're like it's chase and it's a movie about gangsters and it's like wow um still that still ranks really high up there for me and and I don't, I don't give horror in the heights as much praise as I probably should. But then again, it is one that I remember. You know, I remember the the first episode, the Ripper. Um, I remember the zombie episode. Um, I've always liked Mr. Ring simply because I like the whole Android uh, artificial intelligence thing. And then a couple more down the road. And and Bradley, I for some reason, much like uh, the comedian in the latest Twilight Zone. I have begun to like the uh, headless bicycle, bicycle man, uh, motorcycle man, much more and more every time I see it. And I even gave it a whole watch through and I'm like, Oh man, well, it's never been my worst episode. It's never been my worst. Robert, what and is your worst episode? What's the, worst the, the last one? Oh, the last one we with us with his now it's, it's absolutely lovely to see the interaction he has with his wife. Uh, you know, the actress that, that plays the the new police captain, the the rapport with them. It's almost a little like, wait a minute, what's going on here? Like Carl's really into this chick. <laughs> and and so that is delightful. I love seeing that the rapport. I would love to see that continue, you know, on and on and on for the other stories. That to me is just it's just the. It's just, you know, it's just like they were on their last legs, you know, it just couldn't to me be any worse the scene with him going down <laughs> the big industrial hallway in the golf cart whatever thing seems like what had to have inspired michael myers for you know <laughs> austin powers when he's doing the thing where he can't back up and go forward and back up and go forward in his little you know thing that he steals and i'm like just oh man this is so bad but it's it's still it's all you know th this is the you know if I make this one of my children, this is just the child I don't like as much, but they're still my <laughs> children, <laughs> you know, something like that. And we, we were going to ask you what you felt like were you, if you can name a top um, episode for yourself, wonder what that would be. I, well, Horror in the Heights is up there. The Energy Eater, oddly enough, I think. Oh, is, is really? As much as it is. Yeah, Interesting. As much as it is, I really like his interaction with the nurse. I liked his interaction with the shaman as much as that's kind of red faced, uh, you know, it's a little, I, it wouldn't fly today. Let's just put it that way. Right, but I liked right. the interaction. I liked, and I, that's why I liked the second movie almost more than the first movie. Again, the mm -hmm. first movie is the best. So gotcha. But what I liked about the second movie was his interaction with the female college student, I think it's Louise. Right. And there's like a real, it starts to feel like camaraderie. It starts to feel like, like real energy. And it's like, that doesn't get recreated in a lot of the other, it's maybe in the century, because again, the, the actress is his wife, but a lot of them is just clearly people hit their mark and say their lines and you don't feel that spark that you get in some of those episodes. Mm -hmm. Very yeah. good. 